I'm going to guess. I'm going to go out on a limb here. I don't really know this for sure because I'm, I can't read minds. I don't know if you knew that about me or not, but I can't read minds. It's crazy. But I'm going to guess that when you look at me, the word athletic, probably not the first word that crosses your mind. I've never been much of an athlete. I'm not a big exercise guy. Uh, I'm a firm believer that the only legitimate reason why anybody should ever be running is because a bear is actively chasing you. And at that point in time, all I have to do, I don't have to be faster than the bear. I just have to be able to trip you. So at least that's my feelings. But like any good Indiana boy, I love basketball. I love to play it. It's, it's one of my all-time favorite things. You can keep your, your workout equipment. You can keep your treadmill. You can keep whatever else. Just give me a ball, a hoop, and some buddies, and I'm having a good day. I've always loved to play basketball, but that being said, I, I never went out for the middle school or the high school basketball team, uh, partially because I'm just not overly competitive as a person. Like, I, I just want to play to my best, and that's about it but also partially because of the story I'm about to tell you. In sixth grade, I went out for the boys' basketball team. Uh, I, I know I said I didn't go out for the middle school basketball team. I'm old enough that sixth grade was still considered elementary, so that's fun. Um, but I went out for the sixth grade boys' basketball team, and I had been on the fifth grade boys' basketball team the year before. I, I, I'd been on that team. I, I made that tryout, and I, I got the uniform and all that good stuff. Uh, I thought for sure whenever I made the fifth grade boys basketball team, I was going to be the star player because I was in fifth grade. But I think I averaged about three minutes of playing time every game. Uh, usually it was only because somebody else was in foul trouble or it was junk time and we weren't going to win anyway. Uh, never mind the fact that I averaged two points a game for playing three minutes in a game, which had that have spread out and I had gotten more playing time, I'd have been the highest scorer on the team. And we would have won every single game. And I don't know why. The I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Save it for the therapist. But <laughs> having been on the fifth grade boys basketball team, I thought for sure that that meant I would make it on the sixth grade boys basketball team. But when the, the day that tryouts got started, I had to stay home. I had a stomach bug and it wasn't good. So I missed the first day of tryouts, but I came out the next day because I went to school. I forced myself to not take care of things and all that and, and went to school and I was able to stick around and I, I went out for the tryouts. And when I got to the tryouts the first day, I did kind of a quick count of how many guys were there. And I knew exactly how many players had been on the team the year before. And we had one more guy at tryouts than what had been on the team the year before. So that told me only one person is going to get cut. As I was kind of scanning the room, I saw my friend Cole. And I love Cole. He's a great guy. Uh, but I knew I was a better basketball player than Cole. I mean, he was faster than me, sure, he had that, but I was a better rebounder, a better shooter, a better dribbler. Pretty much every other measure of being a good basketball player, I was better than Cole. Every time we played one-on-one -on -one together, I smoked him. It was never even close. So I knew for a fact that I'm making this team. But I, you know, sixth grade Brandon was still trying to be encouraging to his friend, and I I went up to Cole during the course of that tryout, and I told him, again, trying to be encouraging, you know, Cole, you just might have made this team if I was still sick. Maybe encouraging isn't the right word there. The fact remains that I knew I was better than Cole at basketball. I knew that I, I could run circles around him, and the tryouts went fantastic. I mean... It was like I couldn't miss a shot. I grabbed just about every rebound there was. I even blocked the shot of the guy who beat me out for starting center the year before four times. I played better than I'd ever played before in my life at that point in time. So I knew I got this. And the coach uh, uh, called everybody back one at a time at the end of tryouts to, to let us know if we'd made the team or not. And he called several other guys ahead of me and stuff, and me and Cole were sitting there talking, like, so what are you going to do if you don't make the team? Because we both knew it was down to him or I. I don't know how we knew that. We just knew that. <laughs> but we were asking each other, what are you going to do if you don't make the team? And both of us agreed that it'd be all right. Our friendship would endure. But I walked back into the coach's office confident in myself, confident that I knew I had made this team and that Cole was going to be told later that he didn't make the team. 
So you can imagine my surprise when coach told me that I was the one getting cut. He said that I just didn't have enough speed for what he needed. He wanted to run this team really fast, and I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't measure up to it. He also said that while Cole wasn't as good a basketball player as me, Cole seemed to want it more. Cole wanted to be a part of this team more than I seemed to want to. I didn't understand that. I didn't get that because, again, I thought basketball is based on talent, so I thought for sure it would be me. But the coach saw something in Cole that I didn't. The reality of the situation was that, frankly, I just thought I was better than Cole in basketball. And all of us, I think we wrestle with that sort of notion, do we not? I mean, we love to play the compare game. We compare ourselves to the people around us. We compare ourselves to everybody we're in the room with. Sometimes we measure up, sometimes we don't. There are some people who are just far and away better than us by whatever standard that we set for ourselves, and there are other people who we just know for a fact we're better than. And I think it gives us some comfort to, to feel like we're better than other people, does it not? I mean, even if we know we don't measure up to everybody else, we know, at least I'm not them. Yeah, I, I, I can't do this, but I'm not that guy. Yeah, I don't have that house or that car or that boat or whatever it is. But that guy doesn't even have what I have. We kind of use these ways to make us feel a little bit better about ourselves, right? We know that we are not perfect people. We, we understand that. But hey, I'm not them. The problem is, well, the problem is not that this mindset has made its way into the church. The problem is that this mindset has permeated its way to the church all the way down to its very core. Church tends to be a place where we tend to be a little bit judgmental. Where people who come in from the outside who, who are seeking the grace and the redemption of Jesus Christ instead are met with snide looks and backhanded compliments and whispers about who they are and where they've been and what they look like. We have a tendency in the church to, to just kind of glance at people and make our assumptions as to who they are and know that in a lot of cases, they don't measure up. This has been far too big a problem for far too long in the church. The church has been responsible for thousands upon thousands of people not coming to know Jesus. Jesus. Because we play that compare game. And we look at them and we think that they just don't belong. That they don't measure up. That they're not as good as we are. And the problem with this sort of thing is that we have no idea what's really going on in their lives. We have no idea what's going on beyond the surface. You and I can only see what's going on on the surface. We may be able to say things like, well, I saw them at this place, or, or I saw them do this, or I heard them say that. And all that may be true, but we don't really know what's going on beyond the surface. We, we make our judgments based on what we can see. But God has a different perspective. He's able to see things that you and I are unable to see. He's able to see their very heart and their mindset. He knows the pain that they carry with them. He knows how hurtful those comments that we make behind their backs are. But the reality is we think we're better than them. We've kind of taken our salvation that came from Jesus that cost him his very life and we've somehow made that into a thing I call holy arrogance. To think that because I don't go to those places and I don't do those things and I don't say those things, I'm better than them. We don't vocalize that. At least I don't I hope we don't. Man, we certainly think it. We think things like, I mean, I know I'm not perfect. I know I'm still a sinner, but at least I'm not a bad, as bad as... And some of you may have just proved my point because in your mind you put a name to the end of that sentence. We wrestle with this notion of holy arrogance, of believing that because we've been a part of the church for 
however long it is that we've been a part of the church, and because we know about Jesus and we have his salvation, that makes us better than the world outside of us. It has cost us lives. Thousands, possibly millions of lives of people who could have come to know Jesus, who could have gotten that grace and that redemption, and instead they were met with judgment. Snide comments. But we don't know what's going on inside of them. In fact, that's That's the crux of our text today. Jesus tells us a story in our text today in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, about this very sort of thing. While you're turning there, or you're getting your app loaded on your phone, or whatever it is, this parable comes while Jesus is making his way towards Jerusalem. He's begun that journey that's going to ultimately wind up at the cross. This is before the Passion Week. He hasn't even made it to Jericho just yet, but it's not that far away. These things are coming at a time period when Jesus is getting towards the cross. And it seems like lately, as Jesus is getting closer and closer to the Passion Week, that his his messages, his teachings, his stories, they've become a little more pointed. I mean, for his entire ministry, Jesus has had no problem whatsoever in calling out Pharisees who are hypocrites, Sadducees who are are two-faced, and all kinds of other religious elites who make themselves out to be better than what they really are. He's had no problem with that. But it seems like lately, Jesus is trying to poke that bear. And it's led, in his relationship to those religious elite, it's led from them trying to get rid of him, trying to discredit him, to them now actively looking for a way that they might kill him. And i got to tell you, as Jesus tells us this story in Luke 18, I don't think he's going to make any friends in those arenas. Let's read together. Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. It says this. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself, God, I thank you. I am not like other people, greedy, unrighteous adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This parable is really one of comparisons, is it not? I mean, we're given two different characters who are completely and utterly apart as far as their character and who they are and the way that they're perceived in the world around them. But before we, we start to break down this story, before we dive a little deeper into that, there's something I think we need to discuss, all right? Oftentimes when we read parables, particularly, we have a tendency to just focus on what does the parable say, what does it mean to me, all right? But there's something that we miss when we do that. There's something profound that I think that we have a tendency to overlook. Some questions that we need to answer for ourselves <clears throat> to truly understand the parable. And those questions are pretty simple. Who is Jesus talking to? When Jesus tells this story, who is it that he's talking to? And also, why is this story being brought about? See, oftentimes if you look at parables, you begin to understand a deeper meaning behind them if you understand who it's being told to. And Luke, in chapter 18, verse 9, is so very gracious to all of us. He has no problem whatsoever in telling us who the audience is that Jesus is talking to. He writes, he told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. That's a hard pill to swallow, don't you think? Jesus is specifically targeting people who consider themselves to be righteous and use that righteousness to look down on everyone around them. He's not specifically targeting Pharisees. 
there are certainly some Pharisees that this is going to apply to. He's not specifically talking to religious people. But there are some religious people this is going to apply to. He's not specifically talking to the church. But there are some in the church this is going to apply to. The harsh reality is that at some point in time, this could probably have been said about each and every one of us. Every single one of us have probably been guilty of this at some point in time, myself included. But Jesus begins this whole story by telling us about two different men from two different walks of life, completely different characteristics, two completely different backgrounds. But they both have the same intention in mind. They're both going to the temple and they're both going to pray. But when Jesus introduces these characters, he, he immediately tells us two different dichotomies of human beings. He tells us the first one is a Pharisee. And we know that, that even though our, our opinion of Pharisees, given where we come from in our context, our opinion of Pharisees is not really high. In this particular time period, Pharisees, they're the man. They're the one that everybody in town respects. They look up to them. They're sought after. People want to come to them with their problems and get their opinions of it. They are some of the most well-respected men in the world. Their whole life revolves around studying the Word of God and looking to make sure that they follow it to a T. But we also know about tax collectors. We also know about how highly respected those guys are. Nobody likes them. I mean, even in our context today, we're not overly fond of tax collectors. But particularly in this time period, these are guys who are Jewish men working for the Roman Empire. All throughout the New Testament, you see the phrase, sinners and tax collectors. They're considered so bad that they're a category unto themselves. That's fun. There's a good chance that when Jesus said the phrase tax collector heading to the temple, he lost some of his audience because they couldn't buy into that pre pre premise. premise. There we go. Talking is hard. They scoffed when he said a tax collector was going to the temple to pray. They, they may have laughed at that idea because it's so ridiculous. It's so ludicrous. There's no self-respecting tax collector that ever be caught dead in the house of God. Two different guys. Two different positions in society. Two different positions of respect in town. One beloved. One despised. But both these guys make their way into the temple. And when the Pharisee walks in, you can kind of imagine how this picture plays out. He walks in and he's, he's Mr. Popular, right? He's one of the Pharisees. Everybody knows him. Everybody's looking at him. They smile in his direction. They may wave at him. There's a few people who go out of their way to go and say hi. They abandon whole other conversations they're having with other people. Like, oh, hey, I'm sorry. I, I'll get back to you. Just to go and say something to this guy. To have just a moment to talk with him. They're so excited to see him there. A Pharisee walking into the temple, this makes total sense. This is exactly what we expect him to do. But when the tax collector walks in, people aren't as excited to see him. Most folks are avoiding eye contact. Some folks are grimacing. They're looking at him with disgust. What makes you think you could be here? There's probably a few of them whispering, and I'm willing to bet just loud enough that he's able to hear him. That he can hear the hurtful things that they're saying about him. And his being here at the temple. But both men make their way into the inner temple and they begin to pray. And Jesus does something that we never really get to see. He allows you and I an opportunity to eavesdrop on their conversations with God. Have you ever wanted that before? Like just, if somebody says, I'm going to pray for you, you kind of want to overhear that just to make sure they're actually praying for you. Has anybody ever wanted that? Just me? Cool. Anyway, but when he gets to the Pharisee and he tells us about this Pharisee's prayer, the Pharisee's prayer starts off amazing. It starts off fantastic. He starts off, God, I thank you. What a great start to a prayer, right? 
I mean, this is something I've talked about with you that I think that more of our prayers need to start off with God, I thank you versus God, I want or God, I need. We need to have a, a more deeper prayer of gratitude, a chance to thank God for all that he's done for us. And this Pharisee is starting off his prayer, God, I thank you. What an amazing start to his prayer. And then it all goes way downhill super fast. Because the thing that this Pharisee is praying for, God, thank you, I'm not like other people. He's special. His mom told him so. He's not like the people that he surrounds himself with. He's not like the people of this town. He's not like the sinners, the adulterers, the greedy, the dishonest. As he's praying this, his eyes kind of make contact with that tax collector. He even says, I thank you, I'm not like him. This Pharisee believes wholeheartedly that he is better than everybody else around him, but especially this tax collector. He has played the compare game with everybody else around him. He's found himself to be better. This is the absolute definition of what we're calling holy arrogance today. Because the thing that he thinks himself better, the reason why he thinks he's better than everybody else around, is that he goes and he gives God his spiritual highlights. We see them where he says that I fast twice a week, I give a tenth of everything I get. He believes that since he does these spiritual things, that it makes him better than the world around him. That it makes him somehow better than the people around him. And he feels the need to share with God how great he is. If you and I were found out to have been saying this particular prayer to God, are we going to be overly happy about that? Probably not. But then the story shifts. Jesus casts a light over on the other character in this particular story. And again, we get to see a di dichotomy of characteristics. But however, we are looking at somebody whose prayer could not be any more different than that Pharisee tax collector is standing in the back of the room. He's afraid to go forward and stand in the presence of God. The problem the Pharisee did not have, I might add. And the whole time he's there, he's, he can't even bring himself to look up. You get this picture of this man who's just staring at the ground, and not only is he, is he afraid to look up, he's beating his chest over and over again. When you picture somebody doing that sort of thing, the only thing that you can think of is that this is a person in despair. This is somebody who's got something weighing awful heavy on him. And again, Jesus gives us an opportunity to hear this man's prayer, and he, he does it so simply. It's such a simple prayer, but it has so much depth of meaning to it, where the tax collector just keeps saying, God, have mercy on me a sinner. This tax collector is 100% crystal clear on who he is. He knows that he's done things that have violated the laws of God. He knows he's done things that have brought shame to his family. He knows he's done things that have brought shame to anyone even remotely associated with him. He recognizes that he probably doesn't belong here. This is not a place that somebody like him should ever be allowed. He recognizes that he's a man in need of redemption. See, the Pharisee was, was so confident of his own righteousness that the tax collector knew himself to be a man in need of the redemption that only comes from God. Two completely different characteristics, two completely different men, two completely different backgrounds, two completely different prayers. One a prayer of holy arrogance, the other a desperate plea. 
for that which only God can give him. Had their roles have been reversed, we might have understood that a little bit more because in this culture, this context, that would be something that we'd, we'd expect a tax collector to be a fool of himself and a Pharisee to be the one to call for God's redemption. And yet that's not how it goes. Instead, the Pharisee prays a prayer of holy arrogance. The tax collector cries for the mercy of God. He started a path that would ultimately lead him to God. He's earnestly seeking forgiveness, seeking redemption. He's beginning a journey that's going to ultimately lead him to the grace of God. And Jesus clued us in on something much more significant in verse 14 because he tells us exactly who it is that's more justified. He sums up the parable by saying, I tell you, this one, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled but the one who humbles himself will be exalted it's a good story it's relatable is it not and yet if we are willing to take a step back kind of look at ourselves somewhat honestly here to look at the church in a more honest light by and large we have a tendency to resemble the pharisee more than the tax collector do we not By and large, we have a tendency to think ourselves as better than the people around us. We think that somehow because we have taken on the name Christian, because we've been baptized, because we have chosen to follow after Jesus, that that somehow makes us superior to the people around us. It makes ourselves better. But that's not the heart of Christianity. See, the heart of Christianity is us recognizing that we are, in fact, sinners. That we are completely and utterly unworthy of God. If that's news to you today, I'm sorry, but you are unworthy of God just as I am unworthy of God. And yet, because of the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, you and I have a chance to be redeemed. To recognize ourselves just like the tax collector and cry out for God's mercy And to be given it more than we could possibly even come close to handling. And yet instead of obsessively seeking to share that news and that love and that grace and that redemption with the world around us. Instead, we stay in our little bubble of superiority. We allow ourselves to be in holy arrogance. Instead of seeking to share this message to see other people come to know that redemption. Instead, we cast them away. Make them feel as if they don't belong in our midst because they don't measure up to who we are. We got to get rid of this mindset, folks. Because the reality is that you and I have only have an idea of what's going on on the surface. We can only see skin deep. That's it. You have no idea what is going on in the hearts and the minds of the people who are brave enough, who are bold enough to come and sit amongst us. Yeah, you may have seen them there. You may have heard them say that. But you don't know what's going on inside. You don't see what God sees. I'm going to remind you of something that's so simple, but we, we still manage to forget it all the time. You and I as Christians, we are not called to stand in judgment of those around us. We're called to love them. To wrap our arms around them, to welcome them in, to bring that love and that grace and that mercy of Jesus that you needed at one point in time. That you may have forgotten this, but you still need it today. We're called to love 
It is not the position of you and I. It is not the position of the church as a whole to stand in judgment of the world around us. Instead, it's our position to love, to care about, and to hopefully lead them to Jesus. Holy arrogance doesn't get us anything. All it does is it costs more and more lives. Haven't we lost enough already? You and I need to get rid of this holy arrogance to know that we are not better. We're meant to love the world around us. The Pharisee believed he was righteous. Is there anything more dangerous than believing that you're righteous? Is there anything more dangerous than assuming your righteousness? I said this last week, I'm going to say it again. There is nothing in the world more destructive than our assumptions when it comes to God. The tax collector was well aware of his shortcomings. He was well aware of the ways that he had failed. The Pharisee prayed a prayer of arrogance tax collector prayed for mercy. And what's more, Jesus told us who was more justified. The church should never, never be a place of arrogance, holy or otherwise. Rather, it should be a place filled with the love of God, overflowing to the point that we have to share it. Arrogance has nothing to do with God. Proverbs 29, verse 23 says, A person's pride will humble him, but a humble spirit will gain honor. Jesus told us in our text today, and we'll close with this reminder, that everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted.